Hi, guys. Thanks for tuning this episode of the Nick Egan Times. We have an awesome guest on this episode. We have David Page, who is a two-time Emmy-winning producer and had a lengthy career in TV, including creating diners, drive-ins, and dives. David has now written a book, Food Americana, which is based on American cuisine. Welcome, David, and thanks for coming on my podcast. Thanks for having me. How you doing? Good, my friend. How's it all going over there? Not bad, actually. We're finally getting something approaching summer on the South New Jersey shore, so things are good. Amazing. How has life um, changed and been for you since the pandemic's begun, and yeah, how's it affected you personally and professionally? Well, I've been one of the lucky ones in that sitting in an office by yourself writing a book is is not something that's going to be tremendously impacted by an inability to interact with people. Obviously, it had some impact on the reporting process for my book. Personally, um, it's been, you know, uh, my wife and I and and our dogs um, love living where we are, but we're social people. And it's been a tough year being unable to sit down with people over a drink or something to eat. It was just, I don't know, three weeks ago that for the first time, we actually went to a friend's house and and got together. They were vaccinated. We were vaccinated. And it was like a wonderful time machine. We, you know, we we showed up, we hugged, we had wine, we had hors d'oeuvres, he cooked dinner. And it reinforced to me how much our entire society, and I mean that globally, not not just the U.S., how much we have missed in terms of interpersonal contact over the past year, which is such a key part of life. Right. Yeah, we're social creatures, and, yeah, I completely relate to you because we've had a couple of lockdowns where I am in Sydney, and, yeah, when you're get in contact with people it really makes you realize how we are social people and how life's better when you're actually socializing with people god yes i mean i'll drink alone if i have to but really (laughs) (laughs) it's more fun with others i get it 100 percent agree with you um well take us back to growing up and your family and how it all began for you your career i guess in the tv industry as well Okay, I was born in New York City, but pretty quickly my parents decided to escape that kind of environment for me and my sister. So I ended up growing up in Massachusetts, which is the part of the country we call New England, which is the Northeast, in a semi-rural, by American standards, uh, environment. It was all fine and dandy. My dad was a community college administrator. That's a two-year college here. My mother was an accountant. She was a lousy cook. I survived anyway. (laughs) But um, I developed an early interest in broadcasting and ended up choosing a local prep school as a day student instead of um, going to the uh, public high school because they had a little radio station. And from there, I made my collegiate choices based on who had a broadcasting program. Jumped ahead of that and ended up quitting many colleges to follow broadcast jobs around the country. Ended up in television in Kansas, then Phoenix, then Texas. And then NBC picked me up as a producer in Chicago. A couple years later, they sent me overseas. I was based in a number of cities in Europe with the coverage area of um, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. I never got to the Far East. Um, But that was a huge uh, cultural change for me because uh, it had never occurred to me that I could live outside of the country. We are just, as I suspect you know, we're a pretty inward-looking place. And my life was massively changed by the fact that all of a sudden I was living in other cultures and bopping around the world and um, of relevance to my current occupation as as a food journalist. Um, I started tasting foods from other places and understanding that food and especially dining together is, is kind of a a gateway to beginning to understand a culture. So that was an important time for me. 
Uh, I came back to the States, stayed in network news, but eventually, a number of years later, I kind of stumbled into food journalism, created the show Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. I don't know if it runs in Australia. It's a huge hit on the food network here in the States. I, I know it runs on some of the Food Network's international channels. Anyway, that, that, that was a big hit. And um, since then, I produced another series on craft beer. And after dabbling in the world of streaming, I got it in my head that it was time to write a book. So I, I sat down, planning to spend a year. It took two. Uh, it was bisected by COVID. Luckily, um, some big events I had planned to go to had already taken place. Uh, and the, the book came out recently, and now I'm starting on another. Wonderful. That's amazing. Uh, thanks for sharing your insights of your life, too, because you've done, obviously, so much, and it's been an amazing career, everything that you've done today, you. including the books. Um, talk to me about winning two Emmys. What was that like in the process of that? That really interests me. Well, it's bizarre. One of them was for our coverage. Uh, I led NBC's coverage of the Romanian Revolution. And it's the only one of the communist revolutions that actually involved Bang Bang. Um, and it's not something you think about. And um, it happened uh, quite a while later. I was still posted overseas. The ceremony was in New York. So it was, you know, it was fine. It was sort of anticlimactic. Um, it, it's great to win that kind of an award. It's dumb to think it matters much um, unless you're trying to impress someone. Um, unfortunately, for that purpose, I was no longer single, so there was no value in asking <laughs> for my place to see Miami. Uh, uh, the second one was for my supervision of an investigative project at our 2020 news magazine, similar to your 60 Minutes, in which we took a look at how our Veterans Administration the government agency that's supposed to take care of veterans, was doing just a horrible job because pretty much whatever you said you were feeling, they declared that you had PTSD, sent you to a group and, and gave you a certain drug. And this was vastly overlooking all sorts of other problems that veterans were having. And we revealed that the screening process didn't even catch veterans who were faking it's called stolen valor who claimed to have been in combat when they weren't um and uh luckily that won an emmy and um it was funny because i had moved on from the program 2020 to i stayed within the network abc but i had moved on at that point to the morning show good morning america um so it kind of came as an afterthought when someone said you know you got nominated for this and um, I said, that's cool. I, I didn't expect to win because 60 Minutes usually wins here. So I, and there was, it was one of these deals where if you want to go to the ceremony, you can't bring anyone. I would have wanted to bring my wife. So I didn't go to the ceremony. I found out the next way, the day that I'd won. And that's a great feeling. But, um, you know, it's, on the one hand, it's nice to have someone say you did a good job. On the other hand, um it's pretty random. There's an awful lot of people doing good work, and a lot of it's the luck of the draw in a given year. Right. Okay. Although when I did move briefly into home shopping after network news, I mounted one of my Emmys um, very prominently in my office to counteract the fact that I had no experience uh, telling people what to buy on TV. Good for you. <laughs> um... So obviously you've done quite an extensive travel and you've lived obviously quite a few places abroad. Um, where was you? And what, what was probably one of the stories that, um, that you can recall that you could share with the listeners that. My, my favorite place is a place I didn't get to do a whole lot of work. Although I did travel with the prime minister when there was a, a vote pulling out NATO. We, we shadowed the prime minister for a week. Um, but just on a personal level, I adore Spain. On an emotional level, 
because I'm a New York Jew, uh, I do feel a connection to Israel and have covered a lot of stuff in Israel. The, um, I guess the irony there is that much of what I've done in Israel has not reflected well on the government and not to veer off into politics, but being Jewish doesn't mean you support the actions of a particular government. Um, I guess arguably the most long-term important and thrilling thing I did was I was there the night the wall opened and I walked through it into East Berlin at about 3 a.m. And unlike a lot of people who showed up for 10 seconds and took a piece of the wall, to me this was pretty deeply emotional because I had been covering the east side of Berlin for a number of years and I, I felt pretty deeply uh, about the lives they lived over there. So it was it was a big deal to walk through the wall, although it also, because I knew enough about the situation there, it was clear to me that this was not going to be the cakewalk of reunification that people optimistically were predicting and that the folks who had been in the East for the last 30 years were now emotionally and perhaps intellectually pretty removed from their counterparts in the West. And, you know, that, that's been right uh, to this day. Uh, the eastern half of Germany is still a poor stepchild. Amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Um, sure. What about, um, I guess, the traveling that you've done? What was like? What was life like coming back to live in America? Obviously, you would have been so used to the culture as well of like living away. Was life different for you going back to the States? Yeah, it was very different in that and I fell into the same trap as most Americans, my knowledge of the world diminished remarkably because very little of what goes on in the rest of the world gets reported here. We just don't bother with it. And, you know, this was when I was uh, traveling internationally, this was pre-internet. So we all had our shortwave radios and we all listened to the BBC World Service and one day they'd be reporting on a coup in Malawi and the next day there'd be some food shortage in Kurdistan or, or whatever it was. The granular level of knowledge that the average European or Brit um, ingests is, is far greater than the knowledge we ingest about the rest of the world. I got lazy. I mean, I could have subscribed to The Economist, but... Um, I got married, my wife and I started raising our daughter, and to this day, um, I regret the fact that I'm ill-informed. Uh, other than that, you know, um, nothing was that different or, or that unusual. Uh, I actually missed um, the variety of damn fine food, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I was living in New York, which is a reasonable food town. Right. Food. Probably Spanish Mediterranean. Uh, awesome. My wife and I recently actually ordered um, a whole leg of Yamone Berico, the, um, the ham from the pork that has been raised on acorns and but i cheaped out i didn't get the the hanger the, th the thing it sits on so i was kind of holding this this leg with one hand and trying to slice it with the other and uh anyway no i i'm, I'm very fond of spanish food anything mediterranean um not getting too political, too, but where do you see the United States going into the future? Oh, I'd love to say I'm optimistic, but we, we've had some terrible things happen here over the last few years. And all I can say is I hope that we redefine our basic democracy. Um, and I say that as a journalist, which makes me, as a traditional journalist, a First Amendment absolutist. I, I don't know if 
in Australia, you know what the term First Amendment means, but it is um, the First Amendment to our Constitution that guarantees no governmental interference in freedom of speech or assembly or religion. But um, a very bizarre thing is happening now, which is that the left wing, which used to be pro-free speech, is now becoming somewhat anti-free speech in that um, if you say something controversial on a college campus, you may get kicked off. Um, it's the censorship in some respects is coming from the other side. And I am very troubled by that, extremely troubled by that. There is an organization in the U.S. called the American Civil Liberties Union whose mission has always been to defend even the most odious speech in the, I think it was the 90s, might have been earlier, might have been the 70s. It was the ACLU, um, staffed mostly by Jewish lawyers, who went to court to fight for the right of a bunch of neo-Nazis to march in the heavily Jewish, heavily concentration camp survivor populated town of Skokie, Illinois. Uh, and they won that right because you got to defend the worst speech or you can't defend any other kind of speech. And I completely supported that. I fear that the young people in our country don't understand that you can't decide who doesn't get to talk because if you go down that slippery slope, eventually it'll be you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's amazing. And I, I agree with you on that. Definitely, um, you should have a right to speak in a certain way over here too, where you are allowed to freedom of speech and be able to have your own opinion and voice it because, you know, that's democracy just in its general scheme. That, that is the definition, to my mind, of what underlies democracy. And, and we're having some real trouble with that here these days from well-intentioned people who think they're liberal and woke. Um, but um, I wish they'd step back and take a broader look. Uh, on other political items, I was very glad to see that Biden performed well at the G7 and that he seemed to have reestablished our connection with Western democracies. Uh, it's never going to be the same. There's always going to be a tiny lack of trust there at, at, at minimum. But I, I was glad to see that we've kind of returned to um, a rational international political world. Awesome. Um, take us back to when, if you actually, if you had your time over again and you were 18 mm -hmm. again and you could change anything what would you change? I'd be taller. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> no, I, I, the only thing I would change is I was a hard driving um, on fond to read. When I first got to the networks, I was, I was one of those identified as a young hot shot. And I wish along the way I had perhaps said please and thank you a little more. Cool. But I wouldn't change. I mean, look, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. But unless you go through what you've gone through, you don't end up as what you are. And I'm 56 years old now. I've been, been a journalism for 51 years. I am very com comfortable with how I can account for my time for the most part. Um, I like what I'm doing for a living. Um, my wife and I yesterday had our 29th anniversary. Um, Congratulations. My daughter, thank you. My, my daughter is um, finishing up her studies as a poet because there's no way I should ever have any money left. Um, and <laughs> I, I don't know that you can open a poetry store, but I suspect she'll teach. No, I, I wish I had in certain circumstances, been nicer or more tolerant of people. Oh, the rest of it, I'll take the mistakes. It's okay. You learn as you go. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, sure. I guess what, with obviously everything you've done and what you're doing with your books and stuff, what are your other passions and hobbies aside from that? So what do you like to do in your downtime? I read. 
Um, yeah. Hang out with my wife and dogs. I like movies. Be nice to be able to go to movies again. Um, I'd like to rekindle my interest in music. Uh, I do do a radio show once a week on a very small radio station here called Simply Classic, in which I, I pick a genre or an artist each week to focus on who in my and my view alone is somehow classic in some way. Um, I featured Tommy Emmanuel, the Australian guitarist at one point, and Tommy was nice enough to do a telephone interview with me for a show that was of no promotional value to him. It's a tiny station. Um, and the more I do that, the more I want to spend more time on my own just focusing on music. I am one of those um, old fogies who doesn't think anything worth a damn was written or recorded after 1983. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, and obviously, while uh, it's it's been a, um, a professional interest of mine, I'm really into food. Uh, I'm doing a lot of cooking these days and trying, while well, I will never give up on meat, I braised some short ribs the other night that would knock you on your butt, but I am trying to use more <laughs> vegetables and broaden my, my palate a little bit. I just learned, for all of my interest in food, I just ha learned how to make cacio e pepe. Familiar with that? No. That's something you like. Cacio e pepe is an incredibly simple but brilliant dish that is um, one of the basic dishes of Rome. It is bucatini, which is a relatively thick pasta, cooked in a shallow amount of water. And when the water starts to get below the level of the pasta, you scrape in um, some incredible Italian cheese and some crushed black pepper that you have toasted on the stove, stir it together, and that's it. And it's just an ungodly good dish. Sounds incredible. I'll have to come over there and you have to make me some. Hey, fly right over. you Any time. I'm coming over. I am coming over. As soon as I get the vaccine, I'm on a plane out of here. Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, I'm. people think of New Jersey as um, an industrial part of the Northeast. There are parts of it that are, but on our license plates, the state nickname is the Garden State. And we produce the finest tomatoes and the finest corn on earth. And we are a fishing port, a small one. Um, we bring in the finest scallops on earth. So it's, yeah. a, it's a good place if you cook. If you don't cook and you're only going to the restaurants that are serving tourists, you're kind of screwed. But if you cook, you're okay. Um, David, thanks for joining my podcast. I do appreciate your time. Um, do, you're doing amazing um, things, especially with the books that you're doing. So, yeah, thank you for your time. Well, Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're when you welcome. get to the States, we'll go out, we'll have a nice meal. 100%. That is definitely going to happen. You got it. Thanks, mate.